got a guest to Electric Playground or here on Electric Playground to get to. It is my old friend, Mike Wilson, and uh, you are not old, it's just that our, our time together goes back many years. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. Well, How I'm are just you? just gonna squeeze on in. How are you, my friend? I'm gonna take a moment for a hug. I'm gonna hug Victor Lucas. Yes. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's okay Look at that we're all awesome hat, brother. I love it. Gotta so, keep the Texas coming. Uh, you, you, yes, the uh, the Texan who has uh, relocated to uh, Victoria, BC. How's That's that right. going? Uh, you know, it's the promised land up there. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, do do your American friends still think you're crazy? Yeah. Well, I mean, they ask a lot of questions like, yeah. "How can I do it?" Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, it is pretty wonderful up here in the uh, in America's hat. And uh, <laughs> uh, I got to say, I do miss racist, though, especially heavily armed ones. Like, I, if, if there was one thing I could have brought to Canada with me, it would have been that. They're adorable. They heavily are. armed racists. Yes. <laughs> is that how we're starting? <laughs> <laughs> you just got back from, I, I have to ask about this, because uh, not too many guests on the show have stories of climbing a mountain in Peru, but you happen to have one of those. Yeah. You climbed a mountain in Peru. How was that? Um, you know, I've got this new thing uh, going, Victor, and it's honesty. And yeah. what I have to tell you is that uh, I took a bus. Oh, up a lot of that mountain. Okay. <laughs> uh, How was the bus up the mountain? <laughs> it was terrifying, let me tell you. Oh, yes. It was terrifying. Do you wish um, you had climbed it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of do. But, you know, we had our son with us, and, you know. You got buses there. Buses are wonderful buses things. Buses and, and they, they, harrowing in there was, Latin America. Yes. There was still some climbing to do, but yeah, yeah I, I can't take full credit for climbing Machu Picchu. But you made it. I did. You did. I did. You had an adventure. I got adventure the selfie. In Peru. <laughs> you got it's the all, selfie. It's like it's on Instagram. It's official. It all happened. <laughs> That's awesome. So for those that don't know, Mike Wilson is a uh, a veteran in games. Um, and has worked with lots of studios. She worked with id Software and uh, Gathering of Developers and Gamecock and uh, other, uh, what other studios did you work with? Uh, there was Ion Storm Ion for Storm. a minute yes, in, that's between, right. in between id Software and, I, and God Games. That's the first time that we met. There was Gamecock. Yep, I mentioned Gamecock. I don't know Gamecock. how you could forget that. Yep. No, you didn't. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, that was, and then Devolver. And then Devolver. And I think everybody has a fondness for Devolver. Yeah. But it's I do. freaked you out a little bit, I think, because you didn't know how long and how successful this company was going to be, but it's incredibly successful. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Devolver's, uh, we're going to have our 10th birthday soon. Amazing. And that is more. Round than of applause for Devolver, right? The games, like, I think back to the games that Devolver has put out, and I just, I adore them. It's a lot of games. Yeah. It's a lot of games, and that is more than all of those uh, other four companies before that combined. Right. So, so yeah, it's you learned a little... A, you learned a few things. We did. Yeah. We did. We've got a really strong team, and uh, we we came together at this magical time of this sort of indie rebirth. Yes. You know, which was really sweet for us, because we uh, were lucky enough to have started in the industry when really huge games the biggest games were made by really small teams and uh for that to all come back around and just flow right into what we've been doing for for all that time has been pretty sweet did it have to be you know the the opening of the internet stores basically the absence of the stress of packaged goods for a company like devolver to succeed that was certainly a, a big part of it and uh you know hats off <laughs> to uh, Gabe Newell and the guys at uh, Valve for, for working on Steam. I think a lot of people forget that Steam really sucked and uh, <laughs> was a disaster for a long time um, before it was successful. And they really had it together just in time for this new wave of indies. And it, it, yeah. that's really what uh, has enabled Devolver to exist. And not just us, but there's like a, there's a dozen other Devolvers now that are yes. indie publishers doing, you know, Doing the publishing thing, but in a different way, um, perhaps with more respect toward the artist than the traditional model. And, uh, and, and the fact that Steam was started by a game developer, by an independent game developer, I think is really the magic of why it's been so good. And they're a private company, they're small like us, and they haven't had to do anything terrible because of that. And uh, it's really not fair to the larger, 
more terrible companies that are trying to compete with them. <laughs> with all the shareholders that want returns That's right. right That's away. Right. Well, now they have competition as well. They have uh, the Epic Game Store out there. And they do. And they're trying to shake things up in a big way right they now. They do. And I think uh, even uh, the guys at Valve would uh, confess that competition is a good thing. Yeah. And Epic, another independent developer from way back in the day. Yeah. Um, hopefully they will also do it the right way coming from that uh, place in their hearts. You know, I think that's really the key is um, having people that created the games be the people in power that are making the decisions because it, it really changes your mindset. Having either like I, Harry Miller, my main partner in Devolver and all these other companies and I were both lucky enough to start in a position where we were working inside of independent developers, and that's really where our ethics were formed. And right? Harry was at Ritual. He was. Right? He was yeah, at that's Ritual where I met him for the first yeah. time. So yeah. there was this Austin, Dallas kind of scene. Yeah, Dallas, man. Dallas was crushing it in the uh, late 90s. You know, they had id, they had 3D Realms. Uh, ensemble with Age of Empires. Right. They had the uh, Terminal Reality guys that did Monster Truck Madness yes. and a Blair Flight Witch. Simulator yeah. for uh, for Microsoft. Yeah, so there's some early. So I think this is oh one my of our God. first interviews oh, right wow. there in the church. Oh, uh, you did not warn me about this. <laughs> Game day ninety nine. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Vic. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that hair, though. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. It's, it's glorious. amazing. Well, it's and amazing. I remember the Ion Storm trip that we had too. And the visit to the the most expensive real estate in all of Dallas. That's right. That's yes. right. That's that's a very good place to start a company. Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. <laughs> well, what was the? I mean, you, you you've always been able to kind of isolate the interesting ideas and the interesting games and bring them to market. But what is the philosophy? And what gets developers to kind of come to you and mm. come to the groups of people that you put around you? I, I think it can really be, be boiled down to one thing: is um, while we certainly uh, love our uh, customers mm -hmm. um, and, and the fans, we honestly consider the developers we work with our customers. Mm. So we have always tried to be the path of least resistance, the single most attractive place for any artist to want to go right. with their project. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we made some, we, we gained some good ground with that, with with gathering of developers, which was, I think, sort of the first publisher in that mold, and then we well, you sure pissed a lot on the of people model. off then, didn't you? We sure did. You yeah. sure did. Yeah, and that was our job. Yes, like, yeah. Uh, some people needed to be pissed off because publishers back then were just not very good people, yeah. business-wise. To the developers, and, and uh, you know, we were lucky enough to be in a position to be those first guys to go, hey, we think the talent might be the more important part of this equation than the money guys. And so that's basically been the same trick now for, I don't know, 20 years or something. But gathering, I think you guys kind of were crushed by the weight of getting a game we to were. the store. Because we that were. is the challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. we, we uh, games were expensive and experimental, and everybody had their own engine back yeah, then, sure, which is yes. really yeah. increased the risk and the time to make the games quite a bit. Yep. And yeah, we just didn't have enough money to survive that. We, we kind of got tangled up with Take-Two Interactive, who ended up buying us yeah. and then becoming one of the big uh, powers in gaming. And they were not at all that when they invested <laughs> in us. It was, um, yeah, Take-Two is a very interesting company, they right? Are. That whole story and the gambles that they've taken that have yeah. paid off in such a massive way. You know, and I think, you, you, you know, we enjoy all the best television in history now, but it really started with The Sopranos, right? which really started with Take-Two Interactive. Is that true? No. 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 Okay. It is, but they're <laughs> very nothing, similar people. Very similar people. <laughs> nothing you tell me would surprise me at this point. Uh, so how, I'm curious, like, how many of the people that you end up working with at Devolver are based on relationships that you created back at the in the uh, God days? Uh, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Of the well, not all of them. We have a, a big team now of people that were uh, too young to remember God games, but. Uh, the, the five founders of Devolver, uh, three were at, at Gathering of Developers awesome. and Gamecock, and the other two joined during the Gamecock time. So it's, uh, you know, we're the only people that will hang out with one another. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we keep it small and intimate and uh, just hope that it keeps working. Well, you keep it fresh and real as well. And, you know, Thanks. like as somebody that's created a TV show about developers, I share a lot of your same philosophies. Yeah. Right? It's about the talent, you know. It's about, it's the, about the art that they create for us. That's right. When did you know that Devolver was going to be okay? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I guess it would be easy to say when Hotline Miami hit. Yeah. 
Um, we had just started to pay ourselves <laughs> <laughs> just before that, uh, having shipped a couple of uh, Serious Sam uh, reboots. Yeah. <clears throat> and but we still had no money. Like Hotline Miami was an incredibly inexpensive game, and still uncomfortable for us <laughs> because we were we were, we had no money in the bank. Um, yeah. But when that game shipped and hit. And then it wasn't just that, but it was the other in super indie teams. You know, that was a, it was a game made by two people. Yeah. Um, and we were dealing with a lot of these teams, Vlambeer. Yes. Also uh, two people, you know, and they, we just kept getting so energized by these tiny new teams, these powerhouses that were creating things that shook up the world with two people. Um, which is how it used to be back in the day. You yep. know, it used to be the same person doing the art, the programming, the music, the writing, you name it. And that sort of went away as we rushed to get big and, and started making much more impressive games. Um, I would argue that the, the magic that these indies have found is that, you know, games are about being fun. Yeah. Not b about being impressive. And more <clears throat> surprising us. Which That's is right. one of the things that I think Devolver continues to do. When you see a game like Minute, yeah. and you play that and it's brilliant, it's a fantastic game, you know, but it yeah. looks like that doesn't even look like a reality it in 2019. Doesn't. No, yeah. it doesn't. And, and that's the magic of what we're doing is um, we have stayed small. Yeah. You know, like we, we could have grown to be a, a real company by now. We could have maybe gotten an office. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but we haven't. And it's because um, to take a chance on a game like Minute or... Bro Force. You know, Bro, Bro Force. Any Bro Force. Genital jousting, for yeah. instance. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> any of the other games we've taken a chance on that have worked out for us, um, you have to really keep it lean because you can't... None of these games could be predicted to be a success. That's uh, Everybody's a Hero right there. Not a Hero. Oh, not, called, not a Hero, yeah. right. That's uh, yeah. the Ollie Ollie team, right? That's right. Yeah, and did you guys publish Ollie Ollie as well? We did. That's the first incredible. One, yeah. Like, when you start listing the games, you just recognize there's a brilliant team at Devolver deciding what to work with. Because I imagine yeah. you've got a lot of people that you have to say no to at this point. We, we do. It's yeah. um, uh, 25 totally legitimate games a week. Wow. That, that we, you say no to. Yeah. Wow. And uh, the good news is, because of our success, there's been an awful lot of uh, publishers that we don't mind referring these other developers to because they're doing the same thing we're doing right. um, in terms of giving a, a developer a good deal with their IP rights intact and very fair royalties. So um, there's a lot of games out there and a lot of developers. So we, we hope that all of those other publishers that are operating in, a, in an ethical way can also win, you know, and these other developers too, because it is so crowded out there now that you really, you don't always need a publisher, but man, it sure helps. Yeah. Do you, do you work with publishers now? Do you like share some of your philosophies and your styles with other publishers so that they are treating their developers better? I mean, a lot of them, it seems like they ripped the verbiage straight off our website. And <laughs> for a minute, that made us angry. And then we were like, wait a minute, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, that's the best thing that could have happened. You're making change. If, if they're actually following through contractually. But, yes. But yeah, we have um, a friendly uh, competition going with a lot of uh, small publishers. And like at this point, when you've been in the industry as long as you have or I have, yep. like you just want everybody to win. Yeah. You know, and that's that's one of my you, favorite you, things. You about want more people playing. Yeah. You want people to take this medium, like realize that it's art and that it has a cultural significance. It's not just toys. It's not just products. That's it, right. It moves people, and we want to know how they're made and that they're human beings that make these things. It's re it's really interesting that you say that because I feel like that was our first advantage. Like yeah. back in the gathering days is. Um, that was 1998 when we started, and the industry really looked at game developers as the new toy makers. Yeah, they, that's what they thought, and yes. that's why they didn't give them any intellectual property rights or royalties or credits because yep. they were just people in the factory making the toys. Right, and uh, I was lucky enough because I was brought into the industry by my good friend Adrian Carmack, who was just an artist. He was not a anything else, and uh, he, uh, so. I came in from the beginning going, no, this is clearly driven by artists, you know, and then my buddy Adrian, and those, they made Wolfenstein, and then they made Doom, and then they made Quake. I was like, I'm pretty sure these are the important guys over here, not 
not this, these public companies. GT Interactive. GT Interactive, <laughs> right. who at the time they got Doom, their other two products were. There's exactly uh, two people here that know what GT Interactive is. That's right. It's good, you they and were, me. They right? were good, good times home entertainment, <laughs> and they were what they were known for is VHS tapes in Walmart of like Disney movies, but yeah. not actually the Disney movies. They yeah. were ripoffs. Yeah. And uh, their other two products in Interactive, when they got a hold of Doom, were uh, Richard Simmons' Deal a Meal CD ROM and Fabio Screensaver. Oh my God. Didn't they have something to do with the Odd World Inhabitants? Yeah, no, that was after the fact. Yeah, yeah. They actually asked the id guys who we thought were doing cool things. Yeah. And then they went and just signed them all. It was like Duke Nukem. The Odd wow. World guys. Yeah. So you were basically publishing before you were publishing. Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just didn't get any of the money. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you have a, um, like, what's a Devolver game? How do you know when you oh have man, one? Oh, man, that like, is, we have been trying to nail that down for right. 10 years. Well, can I ask you about The Messenger? Yeah. Because that's sure. one of my favorite games of the last six months or it's so. It's a lot of people's favorite it's game. It's an yeah. incredible game out of a studio out of Quebec, Saboteur. Yeah. How do you find that, and how do you know that that's going to be yours, and how do you get the word out, and then it starts winning awards? And I mean, luckily enough, you know, I mentioned the 25 games a week thing, and we, I feel like at this point, at a certain level of game, a certain type of game, I don't know, people are coming to us first. Yeah. And so it's our job to not miss them, right. you know, in the filter. Right. Right. And, uh... I'm going to give, you know, we've got a big team and everybody plays a part, but there's a guy named Nigel Lowry at our company that is sort of the first line of defense on that submission email. Mm -hmm. and was he at Firefly by chance? No, no? he was okay. not. It's Andrew Parsons you're okay. thinking of. Okay. He's our producer. Yeah. He used to also came from a developer. Yeah. No, uh, Nigel came to us uh, when we were Gamecock. He wrote a letter. He was stuck in an ad agency as a marketing person, and he wrote a letter just saying something the effect of he wanted to work on games from the bottom of his pee pee. <laughs> hired! Hired. Well, it certainly got him an interview, <laughs> and he actually got hired uh, over several other more qualified candidates at a, at a price higher than we were willing to pay. Yeah. And I was like, that's the guy. And uh, that's, that's really the last hard thing I did was hiring Nigel. Since then, I've just been, you know, gliding lighting on Nigel awesome uh, no he he is a he's a magical person and he's a, a marketing guy but he also plays through everything all the way mm -hmm. knows every tip and trick mm -hmm. has a wonderful relationship so uh, he's our first line of defense and then now we've built a team around him cool. and us that are like producers and we've got people in China we've got people in Warsaw and London and we still have no office yeah <laughs> but it's but a cool we're way to work though well. right everybody goes home and you guys all sort of meet it's every really once in good a while and, and there are so many shows that we do yeah. that we are kind of on tour all year right. and so that's when we see each other and it's always you know yeah. a big hug instead of a Hello again, Victor. <laughs> right. <laughs> Newman. Hello, Newman. Uh, Hello, I, Victor. I, I know you're going to, it's impossible for you to give me an answer with this, but I'm curious if you have a favorite amongst your many babies at Devolver. Is there one oh game that... Uh, uh, honestly, Broforce is, in my opinion, the most fun game that I've ever been in any way it's crazy. involved in. Yes. Like the, I don't know if you guys have played it, but the most pure fun game... And for me, it, it'll be the game that I beat with my son. Yeah. The first game that he ever beat. And, uh, yeah, that's what it is for me. It's just like, it's it, and it's a total throwback. It's pixel art. You know, it's beautiful. It's funny. And, uh, and I get to tell my son about all the movies that all these characters yeah. were from and TV shows, none of which he was allowed to watch. That's right. <laughs> because they have the Terminator and that's Blade right. and, and they're all Even bronies. Indiana Jones, things that you remember as being these nostalgic little nuggets. The first 15 minutes of Indiana jo of, of Raiders of the Lost Ark is just gunshots to the face yes. and nice knives. And it's like, uh, oh, God, I forgot. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Not yet, son. Yes. But uh, we've been slowly easing him in. Oddly enough, The Matrix turns out to be one of the least Interesting. terrible movies to introduce your he kid that? to action movie. He, we just saw it recently, cool. and he was able to handle it. That's awesome. I love that game. I've got it installed on so many different devices at this point. I've got it on, I just picked it up for the Switch. I freaking love that game. Yeah, uh, I don't know how many games we're going to do. We're up to, we're, we just counted because we're about to turn 10. We've done 70 games now. Amazing. 
And uh, I don't know that anyone will ever take Broforce's place in my heart. Because <laughs> I'm not having coming? any more kids. That's a fact. <laughs> is there what? a sequel coming to Broforce? Uh, Was that to Melissa? It's hard to, to say. Right yeah, there? that's <laughs> Melissa, I know you're watching. And I know we should probably talk about this personally first. but We're announcing on the show, no more kids. No more kids, yes. guys. But um, how about more Broforce? Is that, I sure hope so. You know, those guys. Um, it's up to them. They have since done genital jousting. Okay. Which I don't know if you followed, but uh, it started off as a party game with uh, body parts chasing each other around. It's two and penises extend- going at each other, right? Penises yeah, and also penis there's, there are anuses yeah. and te- oh, there's testicles. Oh, anuses as well. Okay, there are there testicles you go. involved. Happy Monday, everybody. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you followed. It launched on early access and was a huge hit, and yeah. then uh, they did a they did a narrative mode. They did a single player narrative <laughs> mode for the full release, and it won an independent games festival nomination. No way. It didn't win, but it got a nomination That's for great. best narrative of That's any awesome. game. Yeah, it's the story of John, a middle-aged penis, getting ready for his class reunion. That's amazing. We're going to get into <laughs> to your to your latest game very soon. I'm glad we went down that path. Me uh, too. But we um, have E3 coming up and you oh, guys yeah. are amazing with your E3 presentations and I'm wondering if you want to give us a little teaser or an idea of what you have planned for E3 2019. Well, I know this is going to shock you, Victor, but we're not going to be inside the convention center. What? We're going to be across the street yes. uh, constructing our own trailer park again. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't know how many the best years. Party. So, so the, this is a point in my career where I'm just recounting dates and how long it's been. Yeah. So it's our 10th birthday. I realized yesterday that it is 20 years yeah. since the first uh, parking lot party in yes. Los Angeles, which is what we've. Yeah, they don't get the booth. They go. They get trailers like Airstreams and other trailers, and they set them up with all kinds of gaming stations so people can come in and play the games. And mm-hmm. then there's. There's uh, beer and hot dogs and pretzels and all kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, we and tacos. just yeah. Uh, the, the convention center is rough. It's incredibly expensive and it's full of um, the bad games food. industry. Yes. And uh, oh. bad food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, we we just created our own little uh, oasis across the street. You know, one man's oasis. It's an asphalt parking lot. Let's get real, <laughs> with a bunch of trailers in it. But we do give away beer and free food for yep. the people that are there, and, and it's just games. a place to sit down and enjoy some games. Yeah, that's great. So, so we'll be doing that again. But what about your presentation? You guys have had some crazy uh, <laughs> video presentations. Are you were those yeah. successful for you? Is there a, yeah? So, more to so come? Uh, what's this? Is twenty nineteen? So in twenty seventeen. Uh, Nigel, the aforementioned superhero, floated a joke on Twitter that we were all the big companies were announcing their press conferences for E3. I don't know if you guys have watched these. But, oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. And so Nigel thought it would be funny to float a joke that we were going to have a press conference. Did I mention we don't have an office? <laughs> this was two weeks before E3, and the uh, joke went viral. And therefore, we had to come up with a press conference. <laughs> uh, being that we did not have a place, or we weren't invited to participate because we're not actually At participants E3. in E3, <laughs> we're neighbors of E3. Uh, so we had to come up with a press conference in, uh, I think it was 10 days. And, we, uh, and that also went viral. And so then we had to do it again in 2018. And yeah, we'll be doing that one more time. This year, the press, the press conference is always the Sunday before E3, right after Bethesda normally. Fantastic. And uh, <clears throat> that happens to be exactly on our 10th birthday this year. Amazing. So this year, we're actually gonna invite peop- a lot of our industry friends, um, somewhat embarrassingly don't really understand that this is not a real press conference and that it's, <laughs> and there's not a place you can go and they're upset about not having been invited. <laughs> I, th- I think that's what you build to. I guess so. You, you I guess so. Big... So this year we are actually inviting a bunch of our industry friends awesome. to watch our press conference oh, live, amazing. and then we're going to have ourselves a, a 10th birthday party. I, I'm just imagining like a like the the Kiss Psycho Circus game, but as oh, a yeah. as a, a real press conference. That's right. Yeah, it's kind of be like that. <laughs> wow. like motorcycles. Another and throwback. Hadn't thought about that one in a while. All right. Well, this is Weedcraft, Weedcraft mm. Inc., and that's this right. is uh, Devolver's latest baby. It's brand new. It hasn't hit the market yet. No, it's 
coming out uh, in three days. In three days, okay. And so take us in a little bit. I'm gonna, why don't you tell us what the concept is? Sure, here? so the concept, is, this is Devolver's first ever original concept that we commissioned a developer to create. Normally we work with developers that have their own ideas and pitch us. But we just kept talking about I, I, how... I got a lot of crops growing here. ...how <laughs> necessary it was to create a tycoon game about the uh, weed industry right, right now. Right, As it's emerging and evolving. And this was a few years ago, mind you. This was long before um, this wonderful country that I inhabit now decided <laughs> to go fully legal. Um, or we're even really apparently talking about it. But Well, California and Colorado had already done that. That's right. right. California yeah. and Colorado. We knew where there was more to come, but yeah. it was just like um, Devolver's never made a game like this really, but going back to Gathering and Developers, two of our most successful games were Railroad Tycoon 2 and Tropico, right. which still continues today. And I learned personally through those games how much you can learn by playing these games. Right. Like they're truly deep and educational. Like I, I think I learned more from Railroad Tycoon 2 about running a business and the stock market and issuing shares and all this than I ever did in my one business class that I took. <laughs> so it basically and, taught you how to be a games publisher. Kind Your of. Game kind of, yeah. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and so we were just like, man, th these are, these laws are evolving. They're in conflict with each other. Like you can be legal in a state, but illegal federally. And like, it's kind of like running. By the way, this is another good idea for a game if any of you guys are looking. Yeah. Uh, if you did a game about, you know, the booze industry in the Prohibition era. Oh, that'd be fun, right? This would be the same yeah, thing. It's yes. like, it's half legit, half. The untouchables into that stuff. That's right. Yeah. You, you got your smuggling operation and all this. Anyway, we talked about it for a while, and then we uh, finally reached out to this uh, developer that had really impressed us. They had actually worked with uh, um, Good Shepherd, another label we're involved in, on a couple of games. And So who made this? This is Vile Monarch out of Warsaw. Awesome. And so th the distinction here is that this is the first game that you're making. As a, you're not just publishing somebody else's work. That's right. You had the concept and you commissioned it and you've right. got it made and you've brought and, and you're bringing it out to market. Yeah. But you're having some challenges getting it to market right now. We are. This, yeah. this is one that um, because Devolver is not really known for tycoon game publishing. Yeah. Um, once it was greenlit and underway and like I basically personally adopted it as my baby because I believe in the concept and right. I believe in the developer. And, uh, you know, I had had some wonderful prior experiences with the strategy games I mentioned. So um, I got involved with this one as the product manager, which I don't do very often anymore. Um, and I've been working with Vile Monarch for the last, uh, I guess, year and a half on it. And yeah, it has been really challenging along the way in kind of a shocking way. I think, it, especially if you live on the West Coast, um, right. This topic, the subject matter is still like fire to a lot of people. A lot right. of people do not wish to touch it. But it's not about the consumption of the uh, of weed. It's about selling. It's about building it's, a real legit not, business. That's right. right. But yeah. people are still like terrified of this subject, which right. cracks me up. Right. Given that most of what Devolver is known for are hyper-violent games okay. where you murder everybody. Right, and you don't, and you don't do that in here. You, you, you don't a, do that. You, you don't do any drugs. And you're selling to customers, and you can grow your distribution chain and grow into different cities. And that's right. Yeah. And the, the game, there are two scenarios included in the shipping version of the game. Um, the first of which is more grassroots, pardon the pun, <laughs> but you're you know you're an MBA student that. His father has died after benefiting from, from right. uh, using cannabis. Your brother started growing cannabis to help your dad out with his pain management. And then Which is he happening dies. all over the world right now. That's right. Yeah. You're coming home from school and you basically get sucked into this industry um, because it seems like a good business and you're, you've been studying to be a business person. Interesting. And so it's, it's really starting from the ground up with those first plants in your basement, you know, and growing into, uh, you know, a big, but still a very regional, um, type business. I've just got into it a little bit and I've already felt that compulsion. That loop is, is real, man. Yeah, man. Like uh, you, you're building the plants and selling them to customers and you see your cash going up and you invest right. it in more and better lights yeah, and, and different I, strains. I'm and really proud of uh, Vile Monarch for making it so accessible and so intuitive. Cool. Um, I've watched at our press, our press tours, like 
Um, journalists that don't ever play these types of games are jumping right in, having no problem, no questions. And a lot of people shy away from these types of games because they can be very complex. Like yeah. they can, a lot of them, like you really need to read a lot of instructions before you even get started. And that turns a lot of gamers off. This one you can jump right into. And uh, But it, there's still a lot of depth there, all the depth that you would expect from this type of game. Awesome. So hats off to uh, we, we, Vile Monarch for We have some that off. East Side Games people in the audience today. It's good to see you, you guys. Side games. <laughs> and they they had a game, and they still have a game called Potform. Right. And uh, I'm sure they've run into a lot of this kind of experience over time. They may have a, uh, some wisdom to pass on to you. I don't doubt it. Yes. <laughs> we'll have some drinks after later. <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, so we're back to full screen. Let's go back to full screen. This is this is fantastic. So uh, Weedcraft Inc. comes out later this year, but I want or later this week. Yeah. In three days. Uh, but I've got some questions here that I wanted sure. to get to. One of them is great from Sam I M one 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 saying uh, last year's E three alluded to um, RoboCop. Is there uh, not a RoboCop game. Is there or not a RoboCop game coming from Devolver Digital? There. What did you say? It's last year's E3. Yeah. Can alluded. you reframe that last part of the question? Is is there a RoboCop game coming from Devolver Digital? Oh damn, that was way too direct. Yeah. Um, not to my knowledge, there is uh, <laughs> at this time no RoboCop game <laughs> that I'm aware of coming from Devolver that has nothing to do with. The the possibility, you know, because they don't tell me everything. Because I do these shows, yeah. you know, and then I just I have then drinks, I talk <laughs> about things. Um, do, do you guys want to get into any licensing at all? You know, we we dabbled. We did a Reigns version of uh, we did a oh, Game, Game of, of Thrones. Thrones. Yeah, uh, that's a. I don't know if you guys have heard of Game of Thrones. It's a it's a show on HBO. HBO needs I, I I had never heard Can of you it. You guys spread the word. Yeah, they had it's just like yeah. this. Yeah, we, it's very <laughs> grassroots. They need some work. They need some help. Uh, <laughs> but you know, they actually reached out to us about that, and we were like, we've never really looked for licensed games because a lot of times in our experience, your very best and brightest developers have their own ideas and don't necessarily want to work on a licensed property. Right. But in this case, you know, it, it, it was a perfect fit and the developer was terribly excited. Basically, your answer earlier to what makes a developer game is what makes a developer that we respect terribly excited. You know? Fantastic. Like when somebody is really dying to make a thing, yeah. then that's when we're excited. Dude, you know, I play a lot of retro games like everybody in our community does, I think, out there now. There's the people that have been playing games for a while. It's fun to, uh, you guys, I think, started to make us think about retro games and a lot yeah. of the titles that you make. And there's so many good licensed games, but they just disappear because of the the complicated licensing structure. And I think that speaks to the fact that people just don't take this as an art form. They don't take it as a right. legitimate, serious thing that is that needs to sort of exist in perp perpetuity, right? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, Hollywood looks like they barely consider games a thing at all. They look at it as merchandising or toys or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's starting to change, though, because I've gotten a lot of phone calls in the last year yeah. from studios and production companies that are... Oh, that would be great, man. ...super interested in indie games yeah. because they... It's not so much that they're trying to latch on to some mass market thing. Right. What they've found out, what Hollywood has slowly discovered, is that even these indie games like ours have these super rich worlds developed behind them and all of this art and sometimes three scripts worth of writing. Right. You know, like this, this game, Weedcraft, has a ton of writing. Like yeah. If you look into it, and the music and, and then Hollywood world, that's, you know... That's a lot of development cost, and a lot, and and so they're starting to reach out on games that aren't even necessarily huge hits for us. Right, right. So, so they want a license back from the games that you have, and then maybe the door will open the other way as well. That's right, and yeah. part of it is um, because of Netflix, uh, because you know on Netflix you can target what you see on Netflix. What you see is different than what I see, yeah, or what you see, and yeah. it's based just on what you like. And it's almost like cheating yeah. <laughs> because traditionally movie uh, studios and TV uh, networks have had to market it to everybody, hoping to hit that you know small percentage of people that are going to care. Yeah. And so that's why they have to go after really big stuff and they have to make everything mass market, whereas Netflix doesn't care about mass market. They're like, I'm just going to feed Victor and all of his friends exactly what they want to see. And therefore, they can go after things that are uh, much more, less mass market and more interesting 
Ca uh, casting by algorithm. That's right. Creating by algorithm. That's right. It's not. It's kind of creepy, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I want Devolver to make a Flash Gordon game. You done. And I have done a little Facebook back and forth about that. It's but signed. I think Who wants to develop? <laughs> These guys over here. You guys want to make the Flash, Flash Gordon video game? Yeah, the right. 80s Flash Gordon video Green game. Greenlit and right? funded. This Sam Jones, Flash. You These can guys download have, our... Nobody knows what I'm talking about yeah. here right now. Uh, I was... That, there it is, with Queen's yeah. original soundtrack. I think Queen's really cheap right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good time to get into the, <laughs> in the Queen business. <laughs> Um, okay, I don't, I, I, I can't see any uh, all cat. Okay, question: uh, What are your personal favorite games that Evolver published? Well, you said Bro Force. That Bro was Force. from uh, Famous Seamus. Bro Force, you know, um, Serious Sam. A lot of people don't really think about that when they talk about it, but that that has honestly been our bread and butter, like still. Like if you look at our top twenty selling games, most that started of them, a gathering, right? That's what made it special to me is it started at Gathering and the only reason it could come back to us is because of the way we did business because awesome. those guys own their IP and they made a bunch of money off Sirius Sam. So 10 years later, they were able to come back and offer that to us. So, and that again, you know, it really, it was our first release, Sirius Sam H1 HD and 2 HD. And it was really that reminder of how fun those games were, you know, in, a, in an age where particularly first person shooters had gotten more complicated, more about hiding, more about, you know, the visuals or whatever. And these guys are about, you know, shooting while you run backwards, <laughs> you know, and so he headless fun. things screaming at you out of their chest. <laughs> and bombs for hands. That's right. Yes. Bombs for hands. And so like the that one. hand bomb. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I remember, you know, when Serious Sam came across my desk in at God Games and it was like out of nowhere these guys out of Croatia had this demo that just lit the internet on fire. I think we signed it for like fifty grand or <laughs> something amazing. to start with. And now it's still this crazy franchise and those guys also made the Talos Principle. Which is great. Which is another game that's one of our best selling games, one of our best reviewed games that very few people uh, list off when they think of Devolver, Devolver games. People most of, mostly think of us for you know, Hotline Miami and hyper-violent pixel art games. But I, I can't get over your company, and I'm so happy <laughs> that, that uh, you hit this rhythm and you found the company that was right for you and, and for Harry as well, and, yeah. and uh, you've made a lot of developers very successful and very respected around the world, and yeah, you keep man. surprising me with your games, and I'm just really, I'm thrilled, man. Yeah, I've man, known you we're forever, thrilled, too. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just really happy for you. Thanks, Victor. You you rock. <laughs> this isn't is he, pretty isn't cool he awesome? Too, by the way, this isn't it pretty sweet? This guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not bad. We'll have you back for the next game that you've got. Perfect. Okay, right. well, that'll be next week. Okay, next week. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they Katana are busy, Zero so uh, will be next, back week. next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'll you, just, my friend. I'll just be a weekly guest. That sounds perfect. good to me.